Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. The theme of this year's Day of Remembrance program is World War II Nikkei Camp Artifacts, Historical Treasures. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our keynote speaker, Nancy Yukai Russell. Nancy Yukai Russell is a board member of the Berkeley JACL chapter. Her family members were incarcerated at Topaz, Utah. Nancy helped establish the ad hoc committee in Northern California to protest the public auction of Japanese Japanese American concentration camp artwork, which had been collected by Alan Eaton. The group launched a Facebook page called Japanese American History, Not For Sale. The protest made national news, and Heart Mountain prepared legal work to halt the auction, and George Takei also intervened. The auction was canceled, and the collection of 450 objects was acquired by the Japanese American National Museum. Nancy is currently working with the museum to research the origins of the items, which can be traced to living survivors and descendants. Today, Nancy will make a presentation about the importance of preserving historical objects and give examples of story which, eliminate, which illuminate the incarceration history. Please welcome Nancy Yukai Russell. Um, I was very honored to be invited to speak by um, Marsha Hashimoto and the Watsonville JCL. I'm astonished by the amazing array of objects your community has produced. And I think it's perfect for the theme that I'd like to speak to today. Um, I'm calling my presentation Rescued Heritage from the Eaton Auction, Japanese American Cultural Property. And I think that we'd like to think of these objects, of course they come from the hands of our ancestors who were in these camps, but they're also historical artifacts and part of the, the evidence that tells our story. So about one year ago, on March 5th, 2015, in the New York Times, there was an article called, in the art section, and the headline was, Art of Internment Camps Will Head to Auction. And I was actually happened to be with a friend who tore it out of the newspaper and said, you might be interested in this. And I was quite surprised because first of all, we know that our um, historical artifacts are around the house in attics, garages, um, sometimes in special family collections. But I'd never heard of a collection going to auction. And um, we didn't exactly know what kinds of things were going to be for sale, but it seemed like an unusual event. And then this watercolor, um, just, it says uh, by an unknown artist, piqued people's interest. But the online catalog was not going to go online for another three weeks. Once the online catalog went on, I think it was March 29th, so about three and a half weeks later, people could see that there were 24 groups from the Alan Hendershot Eaton Collection, is what it was called. There were approximately 450 items. Two-thirds were photographs, and it was a bit of a shock to see our cultural heritage on the auction block, and things were numbered, which kind of reminded people of having the family numbers, and then with a price tag attached. People began to find things that were associated with their family. Um, a very small group of people were talking amongst themselves, including museums, saying, what, this is unprecedented, but what should we do? It seems not right that people who were illegally held without charges behind barbed wire for up to three years would have their objects for sale and commercialized and somebody would make a profit off of it. Um, but there wasn't any particular organization that could do anything. And so a small group of people in the Bay Area said, well, why don't we write a community letter and have a lot of people sign it to protest it and send it to the auctioneer. Another thing we can do is start an online petition through change.org. And then the third thing was 
why don't we start a Facebook page? None of us knew, knew how to do that, but <laughs> um, this young woman in the corner here is the one who started it from Los Angeles. She pushed the button, we started this, and then it, to our surprise, in one week went viral with about a thousand likes a day. That's about one like a minute, which was just astonishing. And they came from all over the world and all over the country. Um, 33 foreign countries, including the biggest one might have been Japan, but England, um, Canada, um, even there was someone from Iraq, <laughs> um, Kurdistan, Finland, all over the world. It was quite amazing. In addition, there were blogs which were um, helping to publicize this protest. So the Angry Asian Man blog fed traffic. Um, news articles were published in the New York Times. The Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation was working with lawyers to try and stop it. And then George Takei intervened um, two days before the auction um, was to be held and said, I'll help uh, resolve this problem. Many people think that the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation legal suit actually led the auctioneer to cancel it. The the role of social media was very surprising because it's nothing that was planned. But people started making um, a hashtag, stop, hashtag stop Rego, and taking objects that were for sale and putting little memes to Rego auctions, I am worth $800, because this group of photographs was going to be sold for that much. And then this Dos Equis ad uh, was somebody played on that and said, I don't always sell historical items at auction, but when I do, I make sure it exploits the suffering of US concentration camp survivors for profit. And these went viral too. Um, once people started to find about, learn about the auction, because many people didn't know about it, this, for example, Reverend in Sacramento wrote on our Facebook page, to those connected with the auction, the drawings, paintings, photographs, and crafts created by those of Japanese ancestry in prison during World War II are not pieces of art meant to decorate a private collection. They are deep and quiet expressions of the hope and despair felt by a people enduring the trauma of racism, hatred, and fear. What you are planning to sell should be part of our shared social conscience and not viewed as simply art for display. Um, Janice Midikitani, who is a poet and the founding president of the Glide Foundation, she was the second poet laureate of San Francisco, wrote to our page because she found a photograph of her cousin for sale. She wrote to us, I was shocked and appalled to say the least in seeing my cousin, Jimmy Midikitani, photo up for sale in an auction. Jimmy has endured more adversity than most human beings could imagine, not only with the injustice of our incarceration in American concentration camps, but also his struggle for validation as an American citizen. He was homeless for years in the streets of New York, living off the sale of his artwork. Do not commit this travesty of cheapening and selling memories of cherished family members and artwork which is created to survive the isolation and humiliation of the camp experience. So people were writing in, and as I mentioned, the um, auction was canceled. Um, and the Los Angeles Times noted that uh, it was probably one of the largest mobilization of Japanese American voices since redress. But even before the auction was canceled, members of our committee and others started to research the background of these objects because people felt that if, for example, a nameplate led to a family, they might have a claim that the auctioneer just can't sell something that might belong to somebody. And these searches led to different camps and different stories. So today I'd like to illuminate some of these objects and their stories, and I think it's important to continue this research and record the stories of the people who know most about these items. Because once those people are no longer with us, we lose so much of the rich, important history, and that goes for everything here. And I've met some of the daughters and sons of people who made these objects or grandchildren, and it's so important for us to record those histories. It's very inspiring. Alan Eaton was an art expert, and he originally went around to five camps to collect things for an exhibition. He said people gave him things to the point of embarrassment, but not to sell. He visited Amachi, Topaz, Tule Lake, Heart Mountain, and Minidoka, and he had Japanese American agents, representatives in the other camps, and also photographers taking pictures. He hoped to hold an exhibition, but that never happened. He did publish a book in 1952 called Beauty Behind Barbed Wire, The Arts of the Japanese in Our War Relocation Camps. 
He collected by various means. Many things were given to him, but he also bought things. Some things were removed, and some things were given to him without the original owner's knowledge. So I'm going to first um, talk about an Amachi nameplate. And this is a letter that Alan Eaton, who was working for the Russell Sage Foundation in New York at the time, wrote to Estelle Ishigo. And she was helping him at Heart Mountain. And he, he said that, um, I would like you to collect a dozen or more of the most interesting name plants, nameplates to be found on the barracks throughout your camp, Heart Mountain. They sent, they, um, his agents in Amachi, sent me a very attractive lot from Amachi in both English and Japanese. And here you can see a photograph, which was also for sale in a different lot, of um, K. Ideta and this beautiful nameplate on the barrack. And it's typical of the kinds of things that were being sold. Um, you can kind of think of these nameplates, I think, as a way of reclaiming your identity after you've been given a number and depersonalized. And it's a way to um, give more, give agency to your space. So here is one lot of um, 17 nameplates, and they're all kind of jumbled together. The provenance, or the source, said Private Collection Connecticut, but I think many of us would look at these and say the, the, the provenance, the background, is actually our families. And so one of the plates was from Henry Yoshi, and it turns out he was from Watsonville. He was born in Watsonville in 1917, um, and he went to Watsonville High School. So this photograph down in the bottom left shows his yearbook picture. He was really quite a star because he was involved in many things. He had, was in the scholarship club, Spanish club, Latin club, rally, student band. <laughs> um, and it was kind of interesting. If you look at the yearbook, there's some people who had a few activities. He had a lot. His um, father died. His mother was widowed. The family moved to Los Angeles after high school. And so they went to Santa Anita Amachi, not to Poston, which is what would have happened if he'd stayed here. He, um, the family was released to Cleveland, Ohio in 1944. After that, he went to Japan. He served as a criminal investigation um, investigator. He met his wife, Toshie, and um, they got married in Yokohama at the US consulate. He was discharged, and he retired to Arizona. His uh, um, obituary said that he loved to fish and golf and realized one of his dreams when he had a hole in hole in one at the Thunderbird Golf Club. He worked very hard all his life as a landscaper. He passed away in 2009. So I gave this a version of this presentation last summer in Watsonville at the Senior Center. And Nancy um, um, Iwami, in the middle, came up to me afterwards and said, I knew Henry. And I said, oh, you did? She's 101, or she was in July 2015. She had driven herself to the meeting that day, and she had just renewed her license, driver's license for five years. She was extremely lively and wonderful. And she told me that her father, her family had been sharecroppers in Watsonville. She spent her early years picking strawberries and doing farm chores. And she said, I knew Henry, we played on the farm together. And when I said, oh, that's wonderful, when was that? She said, 95 years ago. <laughs> Fast at arithmetic. And then you'll recognize Kimiko Mar and Carol Kaneko in this picture. So we have um, a Nise, a Sanse, and a Yonse here. Um, this was also from Amachi. Um, this was in lot 1245. These are carvings made from fruit crates. And similar to the tiger going through the bamboo that Marsha brought. So Janum has invited our group to do some research on these. And I thought, well, this one looks interesting, and we have a little information on it. I will look into this. To my surprise, two more just like it have um, come out. The one in the middle is now in the Amachi Museum in Colorado. And somebody from Colorado sent me this picture, and I said, oh my gosh, it really matches the one in Los Angeles. And then um, on the Sonoma State website, the one on the far right was in, um, on a, an, on a flyer for the university. And I said, oh my gosh, so these might have been made in an art class together. And perhaps they had a model, like a photograph or a brush painting. Um, this is something we still need to learn about. The, gen the one from Los Angeles, which is on the left, says Fujita in, um, carved in it. No other identification. We're still trying to figure out who he is. 
Um, the one in the middle, which is in Colorado, has the name Jintaro Ando. And then the one on the far right, we know is the Takano family because um, it's in their family collection. You can see in the far right how the wood grain shows out. And how they made these was they carved away from the wood and then what was left was the design. So just to go a little bit about the background of the one in Amachi, you can see it's on the right-hand side in this exhibition display in Colorado. And if you look at the Amachi directory for 1943, Ando Jintaro's name is in it, and he's living in H 8G5F. He's listed as head of the household. And um, I thought it was kind of interesting that when you find online the Amachi directory, the first one, the gray one, was actually, it says, a new cover was designed by popular request. So the new cover is the light blue one. I'm not quite sure, but this first one wasn't popular. It does have barbed wire on it. Um, so looking into Ando's family, um, how did the Amachi Museum get this, this plank? Well, someone named Michi Yasui Ando donated it. Well, who's Michi Yasui Ando? She was, it turns out, the sister of Min Yasui the civil rights hero who took, who intentionally violated the curfew law in Portland, Oregon, and said that I'm an American citizen, you can't strip me of my rights to walk on the street after 8 p.m., and that case went to the Supreme Court. So the, this Michiasui Ando, at the time of, um, in 1942 and 43, was in, 1942, was in a senior in college, and she actually couldn't attend her own graduation ceremony because it was in the evening and the ceremony was only three blocks away from her dormitory, and the university asked permission for her to be escorted in the custody of a dean, but the US military refused. This little picture of the girl in the chair is Michi when she's a child, and the, young, the boy next to her is Min. Um, quite interestingly, Michi wasn't in Amachi, although other members of her family were because she escaped. She got on a bus late at night, she got on a Greyhound bus, and she went to Denver, where her brother was already, had already set himself up. And she said, it was actually a fluke. I could have been stopped because of the five mile travel restriction, but if I'd sat around waiting for anything, I probably would have been sent to one of the evacuation camps. A lot of things would have been different. And she talks about how it was kind of scary because in the 40s, women didn't travel alone, and then just being a Japanese American young woman, um, she was afraid she would be stopped, but she wasn't. The third um, panel is um, made by the father of this woman, Kuki Takeshita, who's 86 years old, and it turns out she was a friend of my parents, <laughs> and she, it's in the family um, collection. This is a close-up. She said that her father had come from Fukuoka um, in the 1920s, and his sister owned movie theaters in the city, and he came here to buy films for her, but he decided not to go back to Japan because in 1924 an immigration law was passed and he wouldn't have been able to come back in the country. So he stayed and he worked for the rest of his life as a gardener. She said, we had no idea he had any artistic skill. He worked for the camp police force, internal security, and um, she said she thinks he did it at night. These little dots here were made by an ice pick, just poking it. And this is a picture of Mr. Um, Takano, who made it. He was, um, the red box shows that he was president of the Buddhist um, church in Alameda. And he was quite afraid, you know, community leaders were being arrested by the FBI. The family left, they witnessed um, a family friend being arrested by the FBI and they left for Cortez the following morning at 5.30. This photograph was taken of him 14 years after he carved that carving. I just put this in because there was a similar kind of object here on the table, but this was the kind of thing that was being sold. Um, these two objects were from Topaz. One is a greeting card made by Hisako Hibi, and the other was a diploma um, given to Tama Tamako Okamoto for her attendance in a shell craft class at Topaz. Um, Tamako was born in Japan in 1884, and she arrived in the U.S. through Seattle in 1905. She raised three children with her husband, Jiro, and right around the time of her 58th birthday, in the spring of 1942, 
Tamako and her family moved under military guard from San Francisco to the San Bruno um, to the Tanferan racetrack. After five months, they went to Topaz, and her grandchildren are still um, in California. This is a photograph by Dorothea Lang of the art school in Tanferan. Now, you may have seen this photograph. Um, this was in, from Tule Lake. This photograph is from Tule Lake. And um, it became quite famous. It was on the New York Times. It was on a lot of newscasts. It was originally published in the book, Beauty Behind Barbed Wire, in 1952. And then it was the, in the bottom right-hand corner is the auction catalog. And his picture was the opening page for the section on Japanese camp art. So a very uh, iconic photograph, actually. So I wondered, who was he? It turns out this is a WRA photograph. Well, he lives in Berkeley. <laughs> and I found him, and I went to his front door and rang his doorbell. <laughs> and luckily, his wife opened the door and said, here's his phone number. And we met and talked. And um, he knew about the photograph, but he's quite surprised to see that 70 years later, it's still in circulation, and he's kind of become a bit of a celebrity. He ended up, um, after, in adulthood, becoming, um, working in education. He was at Berkeley High School, which is where I graduated from. But in the book, um, Alan Eaton wrote about him. His name is Bobby Coneco. And the chapter is called Concerning Festivals and Laughter. And Bobby is wearing sort of this floral headdress on his head, which is made out of cornflake boxes. And they've been paper mache and so the thrust of Eaton's description is that there's a festival, it was Labor Day, the child is laughing, and it kind of takes all of the historical context away from what really happened. And Bobby himself said, why were they celebrating Labor Day at Tule Lake? Were there unions there? <laughs> um, so the bottom, the bottom here where you can see the red line starts is Berkeley in Alameda County. And he told me that his mother was pregnant, um, but the family decided to move to Sacramento County to stay with family friends until the end of the war. That was still considered not a military zone. As you know, what happened was the military zone expanded, and his family was sent north to, you know, to the Oregon border to Tule Lake, and they stayed there for the rest of the war. Um, he said, I remember, uh, he was only four, three or four years old, he said, I remember we used to sit in the boiler room and look through the Sears and the Montgomery Ward's catalogs, and it was like a wish book. I wish I had that, things like that. The boiler room burned down, and I recall getting blamed for it. I don't know why. They had to blame somebody. Um, he talked, too, about how they would say the Pledge of Allegiance, and he just remembered being that whole period as being very confusing. After the war, the family, with the dotted lines, they went from Modoc County to um, Siskiyou County, excuse me. And they father worked as a migrant laborer on the railroad. They stayed there for a little while, and they eventually came back to the Bay Area with the help of family members. The family had all gone to Topaz, because they were in the Bay Area. They didn't go to Sacramento, so the family was divided. Um, this is now objects from Hart Mountain from the Eaton Collection, and his very famous book, Beauty Behind Barbed Wire, was the first book about camp artifacts. Interestingly, the cover photo is, I didn't realize this until I happened to read the fine print, but it's um, embroidery. And the person on the bottom right, Mr. Nagahama, was a teacher of embroidery and he recorded three symbols of Heart Mountain Camp, Heart Mountain in the middle, barbed wire on the bottom left, and the tar paper covered barracks on the right hand side. Heart Mountain has very close connection to this Eaton collection, or at least what I call now the Eaton Holdings or Seaton Assembly, because really Eaton didn't go around collecting things so carefully. It was the end of the war, the camps were closing. So in 1945, he was kind of rushing around trying to gather things, and he really relied on people, such as Estelle Ishigo, here to help him. As you may know, Estelle Ishigo is a white woman whose um, Nisei husband, Arthur, because he was Japanese American, was sent to Heart Mountain, and she didn't want to leave without him, so she went voluntarily with him. When they got married in 1929, interracial marriage was against the law, so they actually had to go to Mexico to get married. 
She was an artist and she documented much of the um, camp um, experience. So some of the things she helped Eaton collect were this extremely um, interesting chair, which has this piece of um, almost like George Nakashima, kind of natural wood as the backing. Um, and that was made by somebody from Los Angeles, and we're still doing research on that. Another thing that came out of, the Eaton, the, out of Eaton's objects was this donation box. And when you open it up, there is a sketch of Heart Mountain on the inside. It was made out of a fruit crate. This chair was attracting interest from a lot of museums all around the country and private collectors. It would, the estimate of this was up to $1,000, but I'm sure that the auctioneer hoped for it to go for more. So Estelle Ishigo was an artist, but she was also an employee of the War Relocation Authority, which means that she was hired to make visual documentation of the camp. So her artwork were actually visual reports, and there were many of her paintings up for auction, including these kinds of um, watercolors. Meanwhile, he was writing to her in the 1940s, so this is an example of a letter that he wrote to her when she's at Heart Mountain, and she had in her, in her um, private, home, in her private um, address book, Mr. Eaton's home address and phone number, they were in constant correspondence, and he said to her, there is nothing more interesting in all the places I've been than the work of the artist and craftsman which you have uncovered for me. Um, so I just want to now show you something which is related to the art, but shows the importance of saving things that we might think are not important, but actually are historical evidence that we need to take care of. This is um, a train schedule which I found when I was at the National Archives last year in Washington, D.C. And the title of it is Master Train Schedule by Trips. In pink it says September, and September 21st. In the yellow box, which I've enlarged, it says trip number 9, 2.30 p.m., Heart Mountain to Tule Lake in train number 3, 435 people, and it arrived at 7 a.m. the following morning. So what this is is the WRA train schedule showing the transfer of people from the 10 camps to Tule Lake, who were the no-nos, and then the people from Tule Lake who were being distributed to the other 10 camps. Why this is interesting is um, Estelle Ishigo painted an oil painting, and she painted it on the very day that that train was leaving, on September 21st, 1943. So this is actually, maybe there weren't any photographs of the people leaving, but this shows um, Japanese American families and people with their suitcases leaving Heart Mountain to go to Tule Lake. Um, because Japanese Americans protested the sale of these things, um, this wasn't sold, it won't go into a private collection, and it'll stay at the Japanese American National Museum. So it's very valuable to keep um, these directories and pieces of paper that don't seem to be connected to things, but brought together kind of fill in some of the pieces of the puzzle. So I just would like to close and say that um, what artifacts are in your garages, your attics, <laughs> your storage spaces, make sure that you save them. And these two um, nameplates were actually displayed at a JCL district meeting recently, and the person who brought them in from French camp said that his church was having a rummage sale, and a Caucasian lady brought in these, a whole bunch of nameplates, I think it was seven or eight, and said, please do with these, you know, do whatever you want with these. And he said, well, we're not gonna sell these. So he put them aside. And um, it turns out that her father helped take the camps apart. He helped demolish them and you know, dismantle the barracks. So he took these off the barracks and he saved them. He gave them to his daughter. And thank goodness she didn't try and sell them on eBay. <laughs> she gave them to um, this man and he's now looking into it. The bottom one, Mr. Kuyama, or the Kuyama family, says Santa Anita, San Diego, Poston. And so we're thinking that perhaps, he, uh, we're not quite sure what this means, but he must have been in Santa Anita and then in Poston. I don't know if San Diego is where he was um, from. But these are all very um, important human lives that we need to research to really understand our history. Thank you very much.